The anti-gun lobby loves to rely on the so-called expertise of the survivors of mass shootings. But should anybody listen to them? Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Boxes, under constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, best-selling author, and most importantly, proud American gun owner. If you haven't subscribed to The Four Boxes, Diner, Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms. I was just reading a story about how survivors of the Yovaldi, Parkland, and Highland Park shootings had come together to try to encourage a so-called assault weapon ban be passed by Congress. As we know, assault weapons are not assault weapons at all. They're just trying to ban semi-automatic firearms that have been with us for 100 plus years. So the question becomes, is should anyone be listening to these survivors of these shootings? Sure, we should be sympathetic to them and uh, you know pray for them and, feel, and have empathy for them, of course. We're human beings and uh, they went through something terrible. It was particularly terrible. They saw probably friends and family members, uh, classmates get shot uh, by crazy people it's a terrible event. No one should have to deal with this. And luckily, most of us never will have to do this. But the reality is, when you're trying to discuss the Second Amendment, public policy appeals to these kinds of emotions are not appropriate. And what do I mean by that? You see, the anti-gunners bring out these survivors and they label them essentially experts. All of a sudden, survivors of a terrible event have become experts in the minds of the anti-gun community. So why do they select survivors as experts. Well, obviously it's because people that have survived something terrible have sort of a moral authority in the sense that you feel bad for them, you feel terrible about what they went through and you want to help them through the event. You want to support them because we're humans and we're kind and, and we have hearts and we care about people and we don't want anyone to suffer terrible events. And when they do, you want to try to help them as best you can and support them. But of course, the reality is this. Even though you never want to diminish the ordeal survivors of mass shootings or survivors of crimes have gone through, the reality is, the hard truth is that survival of one of these events does not automatically make you any kind of a subject matter expert at all. For example, surviving cancer doesn't make you a medical doctor, doesn't make you an expert or oncologist, does it? Surviving a car crash doesn't make you an expert in auto safety. Surviving an uh, airplane crash doesn't make you an expert in aerospace engineering or how to keep a plane flying or how to protect people when airplane crashes. It simply doesn't. I'm sorry. It doesn't make you an expert. Likewise, surviving a shooting does not make one an expert in gun policy or the Second Amendment or its meaning. I'm sorry. It just doesn't. So... Again, why do the anti-gunners do this? Well, we know why they do this. Because they try to take advantage of the fact that people don't want to push back on people that have gone through something terrible. It's human nature not to try to you know, re-injure someone. You want to help them. So when a victim or survivor of one of these terrible events speaks on the topic, it's harder for people to aggressively attack them, to attack their ideas, to disagree with them, to oppose them, because you don't want to come across as a jerk. And you don't want to be a jerk. And that's completely understandable, by the way. You don't want to you know, challenge them. You want to, you want to re-victimize them. No one wants to do this. But that's exactly what the anti-gunners are playing off of. They're trying to use these survivors so that they cannot be attacked and the underlying problems associated with the ideas of gun control will not be examine as thoroughly as it should because people are unwilling to push back against survivors because they feel sorry for them. But here's the reality of it. There's a basic rule, for example, in the federal rules of evidence as to what evidence is allowed into, for example, a courtroom. That's called Rule 702. And one of the things about 702 is uh, courts don't have to allow an evidence if it's superfluous or unnecessary. It doesn't add value. And I would submit that survivors of mass shootings, as a general matter, don't really provide a lot of value on gun policy or Second Amendment rights. I'm not saying this is always the case, but this is frequently the case. And we want to guard against allowing in this kind of testimony or these arguments that haven't been fully vetted. If they've been vetted and they make sense and they're relevant in a particular case, of course, consider the testimony or the protest or the arguments. But as a general matter, you want to be very careful not to let someone's status as a victim or as a survivor somehow take precedence over logic and, and reality and facts and the law. You don't want to do that. And I should mention this. 
The reason why I don't think survivors are necessarily experts besides the obvious points is because their testimony really just points out the obvious. They say it's terrible to be a victim of a mass shooting. It's terrible to see people being a victim of mass shooting. I think we don't need testimony or evidence on that. I think we kind of know this. It's kind of like saying, I think it's bad, and I want to tell you about when I was attacked by a tiger or a lion and how terrible it was. The reality is we all know commonsensically that you don't want to be attacked by a lion or a tiger. We all know that you don't want to be in a car crash. That's bad. We don't need someone to say, I was in a car crash. It was horrible. Yeah, we get this. So by analogy, being shot is bad. We get that. Being a victim of a crime is bad. We know this. We don't need people telling us it's bad to be a victim of a crime. It's bad to be shot. It's bad to be in a mass shooting situation, right? We get this. There's no added value or information that's probative of the question. And yet the anti-gunners, you know, use these people and in my opinion, exploit them to advance their cause. Why? Because they use these people as an excuse to avoid the public policy issues, the constitutional questions, the legal issues, because they don't want to really get to the truth of you know how you save lives, which is with men and women with firearms shooting back against bad people, uh, or you protect things that you care about with men and women with guns, the same way we protect our political elites with people with firearms. That's, you wanna protect the children, protect them like the political elites with people with firearms protecting the children, the same way they protect the president and the vice president. But to avoid these kinds of specific factual arguments, the anti-gunners have a long history of, again, trotting out victims of these mass shootings to try to point at them and say, mass shootings are bad and therefore we need gun control, but avoid the actual issues that we talk about on this channel and that many of you talk about uh, in your gun ranges, in your clubs, in your bars, in your homes, wherever. Okay, well, I hope you learned a little bit something here today. Don't be uh, fooled by appeals to emotion in the context of victims and survivors of mass shootings. Uh, we feel sorry for them. What they've gone through is terrible and we sympathize, but their opinions on these matters are entitled to no greater weight or validity than anybody else's. And in many instances, they're probably entitled to less weight than people that are familiar with the issues being debated, including the Second Amendment and what it means and how it applies in American life. Okay, so I hope you learned something. Um, don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.